Hello and welcome to Paleo Logos. In this episode, we're going to be reacting to a video from Kent Hovind in which he debunks the geologic column. And I thought it's only fitting that we have uh, Christian Ryan from the New Creation blog, uh, the geology student, come and join us for this epic destruction of the geologic column. This will be fun. Well, we'll see if we're persuaded by the end of this um, masterpiece. So let's roll the tape and see the geologic column get destroyed. Oh, boy. Hey, folks, here we are at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. This was a gravel pit for years. They dug down about 30 feet of to all the gravel, sand, and clay out of here, and they stopped right here at this cliff. You can still see these gravel layers. These layers go all the way to North Carolina, 500 miles. Why would there be gravel layers? Hmm. It's gravel, sand, clay. The kids are taught in school that each of the layers of the earth is a different age. The geologic column is one of the biggest lies ever taught in the history of the world. The geologic column does not exist. There's no such thing as a Jurassic age or Triassic or Mississippian. It's all baloney. Wow. The geologic column does not exist. Wow. <laughs> That'll be uh, news to a lot of geologists. Yeah, including, a, I, including I, a number of creation geologists. <laughs> I know. It's quite surprising that he's willing to go this far out. But then again, he goes far out on a lot of things that a lot of people on his own side do not approve of. So maybe it's not too surprising. Yeah. And often, like, I hear the people, like, talking about the geologic column. Like, it doesn't exist one place in the earth. And it's like, yeah, you are all right. But the problem is that it just exists in lots of places in smaller pieces. And that doesn't right. make it any less the geologic column. It's just you're finding parts of it. Yeah, I, I think I think where a lot of people get confused is what um it, it's true that we don't find the entire geologic column in any one place, but we wouldn't really expect to because geologic history is complicated. Nevertheless, there are places where it is mostly complete, like the Grand Staircase. At the bottom, you've got the Precambrian layers. And at the top in, in uh, Bryce Canyon, in, the, in that area, you have stuff from the Lower Cenozoic. So that's, and also in the uh, caves in the Grand Canyon, you have Ice Age fossils, like mm. uh, ground slots. They found caves. Oh really? Where these ground sloths were actually resting. That, that, that those were those were their dens. Wow. Uh, we found like droppings. <laughs> so these really thick layers of sloth droppings. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I did not know yeah. that. We don't have the entire column because again, geologic history is complicated. Yeah, really, we have... wouldn't expect to, right? That's right. It's more of a feature of how geology works rather than something that we would expect. Finding the entire geological column is not a prediction of geology right we wouldn't even expect that because the sediment has to be eroded from someplace right to be mm -hmm. deposited elsewhere all these layers formed at the same time they say the top layer is younger i say really where did it come from oh my all the <laughs> layers formed at the same time no no <laughs> is there any like flood model where anybody would argue that like all of the layers formed at the same time uh, none I'm aware of. That's a little problematic too, because I mean, obviously I wasn't there, but Adam and Eve and the animals were standing on something. Pretty sure it was rocks. So you'd have at least some geology present from the very beginning when God creates the earth. So... <laughs> Yeah, you can't just remove like everything. Um, not to mention it all being deposited at the same time. Like I get like he's trying to argue it's not millions of years, which I obviously agree with. But to argue that it's all laid down at the same time, I mean, that's not even possible, especially since we have like erosion features in the geologic column where we can tell like something was laid down, it was eroded away and deposited somewhere else. That's not mm -hmm. at the same time. That's sequential. Right, yes. And um, also, in addition to having a sequence during the flood, we also have some deposits formed after the flood. Every time people come to our tour here, we show them this little jar <clears throat> that I shake up. 
It always settles out into gravel, sand, clay. Gravel, sand, clay. Okay, is it just me or do I feel like this is not the best example for the geologic column? Because if the geologic column were all laid down at once, would we expect it to have enough time to sort out? Or like if you just have this big mixture of everything that just gets sorted out, then we would expect the entire geologic column to just be like large particles all the way to small particles. But it's not like that it happens like multiple times over, right? In different rock layers, you can have that transition, I think. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have sand and clay and limestone all throughout the geologic record. It's not just in the same layers. And I don't think what he's describing is really reflected in the scriptural account of the flood either. Because as, as um, the text says, the water rose successfully. It had to prevail before it prevailed exceedingly. That took time. So it's not, it's not even covering the earth all at the same time. And in addition, the, the, the text describes the receding flood waters as you know, moving back and forth. So that's going to bring in new sediment. That's going to erode some sediment. It's not going to all deposit the entire column in one go. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I'm not sure how he intends to explain fossils of animals in the same fashion. Because like, the animals need something to walk on during the flood if they're leaving footprints. In fact, I'm not really sure what this bottle is even supposed to represent now that I think about it. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. Like, is it supposed to represent like the entire geologic column? Oh, but that doesn't exist. So just like all the rocks in one area, or is it supposed to like represent a single unit or layer? Or I, I'm not sure. Who knows? <laughs> Every time people come, we flip this little thing over and it always makes hundreds of little bitty layers. Now, wait a minute. They tell the kids the layers are different ages. If you shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? No, they're all the same age. See, this is something else that bothers me when Kent Hovind says this, because like layers are not like, like, a deck of, like, like a deck of cards. Like you can't pick up an entire layer. You, can, you can't shuffle the layers themselves. <laughs> like the layers themselves are made up of different types of sediment grains. So it's... <laughs> right, the principle of superposition doesn't apply to cards in the way it applies to rock layers because cards are easily movable and they stick together. And rock yeah. layers, there's no mechanism to move them like that like right move a deck of cards yeah yeah i mean like i i am sympathetic to the sentiment that layers can form quickly oh, of course yes of course because i feel like yeah i mean that's obviously observable even in the modern world sediments and layers forming quickly but the idea that he's trying to propose is a <laughs> little beyond that let's say yeah this geologic column is one of the biggest hoaxes ever. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all the layers. Well, how long does a dead tree stand around? I feel like, like with the polystrate trees, he's not really attacking the geologic column, but he's more just trying to argue against like millions of years. Yeah, and actually, um, something I recently came across regarding polystrate trees um, you do find them throughout the geologic record, but most of them are in the Carboniferous. Hmm. And I think that's really interesting. Not only does it testify to, you know, there is a layer called the Carboniferous, <laughs> but it also, it kind of contradicts what, what we would expect from a uniformitarian perspective, because it seems like something is unique is happening in the Carboniferous that generates more polystrate trees than any other time in the geologic record. Hmm, that is interesting. You do have a few, like, and, and like, like I said, there are other polystrate trees throughout the geologic record, but most of them are found in the Carboniferous. Okay. Here at this latitude in Lenox, 31 degrees above the equator, we're turning almost 900 miles an hour. The sideways moving water at 900 miles an hour 
would do, take all the rocks and roll them against each other like a rock tumbler does and round them off. All over the world, gravel is rounded. So I think right, he's like trying to explain like these big patches of like rounded rocks. Now, didn't he, he said something about water moving 900 miles an hour. Did you catch that? Yeah, I'm not sure how he got that estimate. <laughs> Shall I, shall I go back up and see how he tried to do that? Here at this latitude in Lenox, 31 degrees above the equator, we're turning almost 900 miles an hour. The sideways moving water at 900 miles an hour would do, take all the rocks and roll them against each other like a rock tumbler does and round them off. All over the world, gravel is rounded. The Earth, he's saying, I guess, moves at 900 miles an hour. Is rotating, I think that's what he's mm -hmm. saying. But the problem is that everything on the earth moves with the earth. So that doesn't cause the water to rotate at 900 miles an hour. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not following his, his logic here. I, I think he's confusing the thing that somehow if the earth is spinning that fast then the water would spin that fast too. Maybe which, that's the, I maybe mean, that's to do is, with the moon. It, because of the plane of motion, it's staying in the same place relative to the earth right so not 900 miles an hour yeah now i have seen a lot of young earth creationists talking about these gravel beds though as like a connection to the flood what are your kind of thoughts on that well um given that he hasn't described the geologic nature of these aside from it's a gravel pit <laughs> um i'm not 100 percent sure okay. but based on where he is uh because he's in alabama right yep okay so interesting thing about the american southeast is geologically speaking it's actually pretty young uh we don't really we, we have some deposits from the upper mesozoic but we don't really we don't see a whole lot of development in this area geologically speaking until the Cenozoic. Mm. So, because we find like a lot of Eocene fossils and Miocene fossils, I think like in Florida and Alabama. Yes, yes. Um, there there's some Cretaceous stuff in Alabama. Uh, it's like some some dinosaur fossils, but yeah, in terms of you, you get much farther south than that, it's just marine fossils until the about the Eocene. So this in uh, kind of a typical young earth creationist framework is actually probably post flood. Mm -hmm. These rounded rock layers are probably not produced by the flood. Probably not. Yeah, there was there would have been a lot of catastrophism after the flood for centuries because uh, a lot of people a lot of people get this impression that after the flood was over there was it was everything back to normal I, i've i've seen some portrayals of noah and the animals coming off the ark there's trees all over the place and like <laughs> it's like it's like nothing happened <laughs> but yeah like there would have been like even even today when we have earthquakes we still feel the aftershocks for hours days sometimes weeks the flood was way bigger than that so we're probably we're the world's probably going to be recovering for a considerable period of time in which case you will have large-scale natural disasters that get smaller and less intense as time goes on and in which case you will get pretty big deposits not as big as the ones that are formed during the flood but pretty big they call it river rock no this is from the flood it was rounded back and forth by the tide going back and forth these rounded rock layers go to North Carolina. If that's a river, that's a big river, 500 miles. All over the world, petrified clams are found. Normally when you find seashells along the beach, as soon as they die, they open. Well, and you hardly ever find a matched pair, but all over the world, petrified clams are found in the closed position. Petrified closed clams. It had to be buried alive quickly. So like, I agree that it had to be buried alive quickly. And I don't really think anybody would dispute that. Like I often get the impression from people as if like people who believe in old earth must believe that every geologic layer formed slowly over millions of years, which isn't at all. 
what they would actually believe, right? I right. mean, I mean, I mean, in fact, they would say that the geologic column and the fossil record is biased towards these catastrophes that happened. And a lot of fossils, they would argue, are buried quickly. So I don't feel like yes. this point is either here nor there. Yeah, they, they say that now, um, but back in back in the day, they held to gradualism, which mm -hmm. it's kind of a, it's kind of a branch of uniformitarianism where they they maintained that geologic processes were pretty slow, except for you know you, you, you get an occasional volcanic eruption or a local flood. The, the, the basic stuff you see today. It wasn't until really until the 20th century when most geologists realized, oh yeah, there were some pretty large scale natural disasters that are far bigger than any we experience today. If the water came up 200 feet and came in at 900 miles an hour, it's gonna make a layer of mud 50 feet thick in 10 seconds and bury the clam beds. They find petrified closed clams on top of Mount Everest. Tallest mountain in the world, full of seashells. I always hear this used as like evidence for Noah's flood, and oh my! <laughs> I mean, it kind of is, but not in the way it's used. <laughs> Precisely. I mean, like they're like, well, the the water covered the mountains, and it's like, well, even if you had water covering the mountains, how would you get a clam brought all the way up to the top of a mountain and put there? Like, yeah, you know, it, it was because the land deformed, not because a clam was living up on top of a mountain. Right. I, I do think this is an argument for the flood, but again, not the way he's using it, because um, a lot of skeptics will argue that, oh, well, you, you can't, there, there isn't enough water on the planet to cover Mount Everest, which is true, okay. but Mount Everest has marine fossils in it, not on it, as people like to say, but it's in the, 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 um, Mm -hmm. The rocks making up Mount Everest contain marine fossils, which means Mount Everest was not always a mountain. <laughs> right. And yeah, yeah. So he, he's kind of arguing that, that that is proof that the flood covered the highest mountains, which it really is not. It's actually just proof that Mount Everest was once a flat area where clams were living. Today, the world's record biggest oysters, 14 inches. They find fossilized oysters in the mountains in Peru, 500 of them, all bigger than the world's record. Here's a guy laying on one. There's 11 and a half foot oyster found two miles above sea level. I think there was a flood. If the water came up 200 feet and came in at 900 miles an hour, it's gonna knock all the trees down and bury them under a layer of mud and form coal. But you know, coal is always found in seams, no exception. Sometimes multiple layers of coal. So I mean like, this thing about the tide coming in at 900 miles an hour is obviously a little crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there's also kind of, I guess we would kind of differ in our, a little bit at least in our explanations of kind of coal formation, probably. A little bit. I've, um, I've seen some proposals that the, uh, the coal layers could be deposited by current activity, but I don't, I don't think it would have been 900 miles per hour. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> coal, gravel, coal, gravel. Well, that's the tide going back and forth, a different tide. Every six hours, 12 and a half minutes, you'd have a tidal change. Noah was in the ark for 880 tidal changes. The water came up, down, up, down, in, out, in, out, 880 times. It'd make all these layers in one day. But wait a minute, the 880 tidal changes is if you are calculating how many days Noah was on the ark and calculating that those tidal changes happen twice a day, the idea that all those formed in one day kind of contradicts that because you are saying there was 880 tidal changes over the course of like a year when Noah was on the ark. Right. And you're somehow saying that fits into one day. Mm hmm I don't get that. Because, <laughs> like, I get that, like, tidal changes could be an influence, but 880 of them happen over a year, so not mm -hmm. 880 in a day, and that seems to be confusing to him. Yeah. I'm, I'm not following his logic. 
<laughs> I'm not sure there is much logic to follow. Probably not. <laughs> not millions of years. We shook this up a few minutes ago. It's already settling out. Gravel, sand, clay. Huh, give it a few more minutes, see what it does. It does it every time. The flood explains all the geology of the world. There is no such thing as a geologic column. One of the biggest lies ever taught to kids in school. They say during the Archean era, there's no such thing as an Archean era. This geologic column that they teach is the Bible to the evolutionist, number one, and it's an absolute lie. Okay, well, having gone through basically the whole video, I don't feel like he ever actually said why the geologic column is false. Did you kind of get that impression? Um, basically, we know it's false because layers can be deposited very rapidly. But he which... didn't really prove that they had deposited rapidly. <laughs> so, like, I kind of reached the end where, like, he didn't really convince, he didn't really provide any actual evidence that the entire geologic column formed at once. He said rock layers or sand can deposit rapidly, but he didn't really provide any evidence beyond that. Yeah. Um, and apparently layers can get shuffled like cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's somewhat problematic. Yeah. Oh, boy. So overall, um, I think the the geologic column remains uh, rather firm after that. I didn't feel like it uh, it got blown out of the water too hard by Kent Hovind's logic there. No. Okay, so before we go, we have to kind of talk about one last part of Kent Hovind's logic, which wasn't mentioned in this particular video, unfortunately. But he talks a lot about how we date the fossils by the rocks and the rocks by the fossils, and thus it's circular reasoning, and that disproves the geologic column. What do you think of that? Well, I think it's oversimplifying uh, how geologists determine which layers are older. Now, when we're talking about ages of rocks, we have to differentiate between absolute dating and relative dating. When it comes to absolute dating, geologists are looking for a specific age, more or less. Um, I don't, as a younger creationist, I don't agree with <laughs> most of the dates assigned to the rocks. But nevertheless, that's where relative dating comes in. So that determines the sequence, not, not necessarily the specific age of a rock, but which rocks are older than other rocks. So uh, Kent Hovind's logic is a little simplified in that when geologists are trying to relatively date a rock, they actually look at a number of different features, including the fossils. Uh, they'll, they'll look at the type of sediment, the sh even the, the shape of the sediment grains making up the layer. It's a number of different things that geologists use to differentiate one layer apart from the others. So it's not really circular reasoning. This is what we expect to find in this layer from our research of this layer. It's kind of like if I went to the African savanna, I'd expect to find lions. It's not circular reasoning because based on what I know about the African savanna, I expect to find lions there. <laughs> so what would be circular reasoning is to expect to go to a zoo in America, find a lion in the zoo and argue that this must be Africa. But that yeah. is not what we are doing with the geologic column. Right. All right, well, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I, I think I am still a believer in the geologic column for now uh, until Kent Hovind's next video comes out. So thank you for helping me through that, Christian. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and thanks for joining us.